In this video I'll be going through the 2023 Mechanical Systems paper. Question 1. Tane has a toy car track set, part of the track is a horizontal banked curve, and part of it has a vertical loop. For this question, assume that sideways friction on the tyres is negligible, the toy car has a mass of 0.120 kilograms. On the diagram below, draw a vector diagram to identify the net force that is responsible for the car going in a horizontal circle along the banked curve, and label the net force. The car will experience a reaction force from the track, its vertical component is counteracting the gravity force, leaving its horizontal component, which is unopposed and serves as our net force, and also our centripetal force. The banked curve of the track has a radius of 0.750 meters. Calculate the angle of banking when there is no sideways friction on the wheels of the car, as it goes around the banked curve at 1.55 meters per second. Taking our vectors from here and pulling them out into a triangle, we have our reaction force at an angle that I'll exaggerate so we can see this more clearly. We have our downwards force of gravity and our net force, which is functioning as a centripetal force. We know we have a right angle here, and the angle that we're trying to find is this one here. We can find the force of gravity by taking the mass and multiplying it by the gravitational acceleration. And because we know the mass, radius, and velocity, we can also find the centripetal force, where the force of gravity is our adjacent side, and our centripetal force is the opposite side, meaning that we can use the Toa relationship in Sokotoa. That is that tan of the angle, which we're trying to find, is equal to our opposite, which is the centripetal force, divided by the adjacent, which is our gravitational force. Solving this for the angle by taking the inverse tan of both sides, we now need to find our centripetal and gravitational forces. Our gravitational force is just mass times the acceleration due to gravity, we were given our mass up here as 0.120, and our acceleration due to gravity is just 9.81, which gives me 1.18 newtons to three significant figures. To find our centripetal force, we can use our equation mv squared over r, where we know all of these values. Which gives me 0.384 newtons to three significant figures. Putting these into our final equation, gives me 18.0 degrees. The diagram below is a simplified version of the vertical circular loop that makes up part of the car track. Explain why the person sitting in a car on an actual roller coaster would feel heavier at the bottom of the loop compared to at the top of the loop. Begin your answer by drawing labelled vectors in the diagram at the bottom of the opposite page to represent the forces acting on the car when it is at the top of the loop and when it is at the bottom of the loop. Imagining the forces on someone at the top and the bottom, the first force we can draw is the gravitational force, which is the same in both cases. At the top of the loop, the centripetal force is mostly provided by gravity, and depending on the speed, some amount of reaction force. At the bottom, however, the gravity force is opposite to the centripetal force, and so our reaction force not only needs to cancel out gravity, but it also needs to provide the centripetal force by itself. So let's write that down. How heavy a person feels depends on the size of the reaction force. At the top of the loop, Fc is mostly provided by Fg, so Fr is relatively small. At the bottom, Fr must not only oppose Fg, it must provide the entirety of Fc, so Fr is relatively large. The toy car of mass 0.120 kilograms approaches the vertical circular loop of radius 0.250 meter. Calculate the speed with which the car must approach the bottom of the loop to be able to go around the vertical circular loop such that the car seems weightless at the top. For the car to seem weightless at the top, the reaction force must be equal to zero. In this case, the centripetal force must be provided entirely by the gravitational force. We know that the kinetic energy at the bottom of the loop is at the top of the loop, going to be equal to the gravitational potential energy plus the kinetic energy at the top. We know that kinetic energy is equal to half mv squared, 
and that gravitational potential energy is mgh, where our h is double the radius. We can divide out the mass. And now solving for Vb by multiplying everything by 2. And square rooting both sides. We know G, we know R, but we don't know VT, so we need to find that. What we do know, however, is at the top of the loop, FC is equal to FG, where FC is MV squared over R and FG is MG, we can divide out the mass and solve this for V squared by multiplying both sides by R. What this means is that we can just replace our VT squared with GR. 4GR plus GR is 5GR. Putting our numbers in gives me 3.50 meters per second. Question 2. Tane works weekends unloading barrels. In one instance, he rolls an empty barrel of mass 5.50 kilograms and radius of 0 0.280 meter down a ramp that is 1.34 meters high. The linear speed of the barrel when it reaches the bottom of the ramp is 3.40 meters per second. Describe the energy changes that take place as the barrel rolls down the ramp. At the top, the barrel has gravitational potential energy, which is converted to linear and rotational kinetic energy. Calculate the rotational inertia of the barrel. Begin your answer by calculating the gravitational potential energy at the top, the angle of velocity of the barrel as it reaches the bottom of the ramp, and assume no energy is lost due to friction. Our gravitational potential energy at the top is just mgh, where our mass was 5.5 and our height was 1.34, which gives me 72.3 joules. We know we can relate the linear velocity at the bottom of the ramp as the angle of velocity multiplied by the radius. Solving this for omega, where our linear velocity was 3.40 and the radius of our barrel was 0 0.280, which gives me 12.1 radians per second to three significant figures. And now as we're hinted to do so here, let's look at the energies. We know that our gravitational potential energy at the top is converted into linear and rotational kinetic energy, where we know the equations are half mv squared and half i omega squared respectively, where our i is what we're trying to find. Fortunately, we know our gravitational potential energy, we know our mass, we know the linear velocity at the bottom, and we calculated our angular velocity. All we need to do is solve this equation for i. My first step is to subtract half mv squared from both sides, and I'll swap them around. Multiplying both sides by 2, and dividing both sides by omega squared. Putting our numbers in, gives me 0 0.553 kilogram meter square to three significant figures. Tane then sits on a swiveling stool, holding a full bottle of water in each hand. He notices that when he holds the bottles with his arms outstretched, he tends to spin more slowly, as compared to when he brings his arms inwards, close to his body. Explain the reason for this observation. Imagining Tane with his arms outwards, because his mass is distributed at a larger radius, and we know that rotational inertia is proportional to mr squared, an increased radius means a greatly increased rotational inertia, which if we assume conservation of angular momentum, and knowing that angular momentum is I omega, our angular momentum stays the same, so that if our rotational inertia increases, our angular velocity must decrease. So let's write that down. When Tane brings his arms out, he increases the radius at which the bottle's mass is distributed. Since I is proportional to mr squared and m is constant, I increases. Because L equals I omega, if I increases and L is conserved, no external net torque, omega must decrease. Tane spins with an angle of velocity of 3 radians per second when his arms are outstretched. When he brings his arms in, he reaches an angle of velocity of 7 radians per second in a time of 4.5 seconds. Calculate his angular acceleration and the number of revolutions made in this time. And so we have our initial angle of velocity, we have our final angle of velocity, and we have our time. 
To find our angular acceleration, we can use this equation here, solving for acceleration by subtracting omega i from both sides and swapping them around, dividing both sides by t, and putting our numbers in, gives me 0.889 radians per second per second, two three significant figures. Now to find the number of revolutions made, we need to find our angle. To do that, we can use this equation here, putting in our numbers, gives me 22.5 radians. To find the amount of revolutions, we need to take this angle and divide it by the amount of radians in one revolution, which is 2 pi, giving me 3.58 to three significant figures. Question three. Tanya is studying the motion of a toy bouncing up and down at the end of a spring that is hanging from the ceiling. The spring has a spring constant of 24.6 newtons per meter. Tanya draws an acceleration against displacement graph, as shown below, of the toy on the spring that is bouncing up and down in simple harmonic motion. Given the equation relating to simple harmonic motion as a equals negative omega squared y, describe how the gradient of the graph line relates to the frequency of oscillation. Since we have our acceleration as our y, and our displacement is our x, and y equals mx, if y is our acceleration, and x is our displacement, that means our gradient must be negative omega squared. Now we're asked to relate this to the frequency, and we're given the equation that omega is 2 pi f, putting that in, and simplifying that, we get negative 4 pi squared f squared. By calculating the gradient of the graph, show that the period of oscillation is 0.199 seconds, and hence determine the mass of the toy hanging on the spring. The gradient of our graph is our change in y over change in x, where we have a change of negative 20 over a change in x of 0.02, which gives me a gradient of negative 1000. Now, knowing that this gradient of negative 1000 is also equal to negative 4 pi squared f squared, where we know that f is 1 over t, our period, which is what we're first trying to show, so we can make that substitution. We can solve for the period by swapping our negative 1000 with our over t squared, which is a thing you can mathematically do. And finally, square rooting both sides indeed gives me 0.199 seconds. Now to find our mass, on the formula sheet you'll find this equation here, which we can solve for mass by dividing both sides by 2 pi, squaring both sides, and multiplying both sides by k, and I'll also swap them around. Putting our numbers in, where we were given k all the way up here is 24.6, gives me 0.0247 kilograms to three significant figures. Tanya then pulls the spring of period t equals 0.199 seconds down through a distance of 0.100 meters from the equilibrium position, and then releases it so that the toy bounces up and down in simple harmonic motion. By using a reference circle or otherwise, calculate the time the toy on the spring would take to travel a distance of 0.140 meters up from its release position. On our phasor diagram, our initial vector is this one here to our initial displacement. As our toy rushes up, our vector traces an angle here till it reaches the displacement of the toy, giving us an arrow about here, where this is our angle, which we know is equal to omega t. Dividing both sides by omega and swapping them around to solve for t, which is what we're trying to find, we don't know either of these things. However, up here, we found that our negative omega squared was equal to our gradient, which is negative 1000. Which means omega squared is equal to 1000. Solving this for omega by square rooting both sides, which gives me 31.6 radians per second. Now to find our angle, we have a quarter of a revolution which is 2 pi divided by 4, or pi divided by 2. We then need to add to that this angle here, which we'll call phi. 
This here gives us a triangle, which we can pull out of here, where we have our radius, which is our maximum amplitude of 0 0.1. We have our angle that we're trying to find, and we know that this distance here is going to be 0 0.140 minus our 0 0.1, which is 0 0.04. Now, this is our hypotenuse, and this is our opposite, where this is a right angle. That means to find our angle, we need to use the SO relationship in Sokotoa, which is that sine of the angle that we're trying to find, is equal to the opposite of 0.04, divided by our hypotenuse of 0.1. Solving this for angle by taking the inverse sine of both sides, gives me 0.42 radians, making sure that your calculator is in radians. Putting these together gives me 1.98 radians to three significant figures. Putting these numbers into our final equation gives me 0.0627 seconds. Tanya notices that once she has pulled down the toy on the spring by 0.1 meters and set it oscillating in simple harmonic motion with a period of 0.199 seconds, the amplitude gradually decreases with time and eventually the toy on the spring stops oscillating. State the name of this phenomenon and explain what causes a decrease in amplitude. This is called damping and is due to energy losses to friction. Using the axis below, draw a graph of amplitude against time for three complete oscillations, where if this is our amplitude, she initially pulls the spring down, so we're going to start from here. The key thing we need to show is that the wavelength will not change. So we'll return down to here, and then make sure we're an equal distance to here, and then once again an equal distance to here, where we're losing energy with each oscillation. To help me draw this, I'm going to mirror this on the other side and sketch a sort of envelope where this is a period, this is two periods, and this is three periods. We also know that the spring was pulled down by 0.1 meters, so we need to indicate that. Now, my graph here is by no means perfect, but it still ticks all of the excellence points. In the schedule for excellence, you need to have written damping, you need to show some understanding that there are energy losses due to friction, correct cosine shape showing decreased amplitude over three cycles, which, although not perfect, this certainly counts, three cycles with constant time periods, and correct labels and values on axes for amplitude and our periods. And we're done.